Hello, everybody. And welcome to the PACOM and CMS Partnership. Um, we have another webinar today. It is Practice Manager's Guide to ICD-10. Um, we want to thank CMS for working with PACOM on this initiative. This is part of a webinar series. And you can see other webinars from the series at the PACOM YouTube channel at youtube.com slash PACOM. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on that page, the youtube.com slash PACOM channel tomorrow. Um, also, there is one CEU being approved. And if you send a request to CEU at PACOM.com, we will send you a certificate. For PACOM members, you can simply go into your CEU log and note that you attended this event. Joining us today is Paul Anderson. He's a health insurance specialist with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services Administrative Simplifications Group in the Office of eHealth and Standards. Paul is a graduate, a graduate from the George Washington University and was conferred the degree of Clinical Management and Leadership. Paul is also a formal combat medic and veteran of the United States Army. Thank you for your service. Paul, it's all you. Uh, thank you. Um, how, how is everybody doing? I hope everybody is okay. Uh, I just wanted to send you greetings from CMS and let you guys know that we do recognize the issues and challenges that you all face, and we hope to help partner with you guys to fix some of those challenges and help alleviate some of those concerns. Um, my job today is just to introduce your presenter, so I'll go ahead and do that and we'll get this started. Mandy Willis is going to be your presenter today. She is a certified coding specialist and an AHIMA approved ICD-10 trainer with over 15 years of experience in the healthcare industry. She has worked in a small physician practice environment as well as commercial payer and with Medicare and Medicaid as well. Currently, her focus is solely on assisting all sectors of the healthcare industry and making the transition to ICD-10. So without further notice, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Mandy. Thanks. Thank you, Paul, for that lovely introduction. Um, and thank you all for joining me today to talk about ICD-10, which is a uh, subject that is very near and dear to my heart. I actually got my start in the healthcare industry working in a small physician practice, and I am still very much connected to those roots. And I can see how something like ICD-10 can be a very difficult task when you have limited resources and time. Um, and projects like these can take time and focus away from your patients, which is we know um, we are, I'm sorry, I need to stop for a second. Is there an issue with not being able to hear me? Can you hear me now? Oh. Can you hear me now? Okay, I apologize. There must be um, some issue with my phone. Thank you for hanging in, hanging in with me. Um, as I was saying, we all know um, we all know that your primary responsibility is to your patients and your projects. And projects like these can take time and focus away from where it needs to be. So the intent of this webinar um, is to guide you through what needs to be addressed with the implementation of ICD-10. And, and that, I think, is the most important focus right now as we are coming closer to the date of implementation. So as we get started, let's start at the beginning um, with some implementation and impacts. Uh, as you know, the implementation date for ICD-10 is on October 1, 2014. This is less than a year away. And by now, I'm sure you've seen presentations about what ICD-10 what it looks like and some of the impacts it will have on the industry. If you haven't seen um, any presentations that, that give you those, those background uh, basics and the ins and outs of ICD-10, I, I encourage you uh, to visit the PACOM YouTube channel um, where you can find many of those, uh, the previous webinars that focus on those areas and I'm sure that they would be of extreme value. Um, we can discuss in, in a little bit of detail some of those basics, but in this webinar, we will be focused on the tasks that need to be addressed in order to be ICD-10 compliant on October 1, 2014. We are on target for that date. There will be no, no delays, so we need to jump in and get started um, on, on, the next, um, on, on the next chapter of ICD-10 implementation. 
So in order to move forward and understand what we need to look at and address, we need to understand what the impacts are to the physician practice. Not all of these impacts will apply to every practice. Some practices are using EHRs or electronic health records, while others are using paper uh, to document medical records and then submit the claims. The landscape of how we, how we, how we bill, how we um, document is vast and varied. And the goal is to understand where your specific impacts might lie. So that's what we want to try and understand and, and get to the root of in this presentation and, and as you move forward closer to the implementation date. Coding and billing obviously is the most critical impact since we require diagnosis codes to submit the claims and therefore receive our reimbursement. Um, so it is critical to look at where diagnosis codes can be found within your practice like the practice management system or on the super bill. Maybe you use some sort of purchased or free billing software. Uh, do you have a charge master and does it include diagnosis codes? What kind of billing edits do your systems employ before a claim leaves your practice? And then lastly, how does training fit into your practice? But there are other areas within the practice that will be impacted and could have implications on patient care. Um, some that come to mind are referrals and authorizations and labs that require diagnosis codes to justify lab tests. So it is important uh, that we know what they will need in an ICD-10 world. The same goes for imaging services. And what about referrals to other specialists? They're going to be using our information um, and we may be using other providers' information. So we want to make sure that the information from a diagnostic perspective is clear and accurate. And then what about prior authorizations for services and procedures? These will all require ICD-10 codes effective for dates of service um, on and after October 1, 2014. So we want to make sure that we know what is needed for our daily, our daily tasks in order to make sure that we can do what is needed in, in ICD-10. And don't forget about your health plans. Um, they may be making changes to their benefits and coverage policies because of ICD-10, as well as the Affordable Care Act. A lot of changes around benefits and coverage will be taking place next year. So when verifying coverage and benefits for a patient, it will be important to understand how this will translate in ICD-10 um, and if ICD-10 has an impact in those areas. Compliance is very important since ICD-10 is a federal mandate and it does carry penalties for noncompliance. So we want to make sure that we are ready to submit claims in ICD-10 on October 1, 2014. Beyond that, if there is a regional, state, or national reporting that you are required to do, then you'll want to assess what those impacts are and what you will need to do in order to report in ICD-10. Examples might be public health reporting or a cancer registry. So it's very important to look at those and, and contact who, who you need to contact in order to understand what they are going to need from you um, in an ICD-10 world and if there's anything that you need to do on your side to help them meet those needs as well. Reimbursement impacts need to be fleshed out so that you know what to expect post-transition. Um, are you a part of a managed care network that provides reimbursement based on spe specific health conditions? Um, what about pay for performance reimbursements that might use diagnosis codes to track outcomes? Or claims denials that come from inappropriate or inaccurate diagnosis codes? These are just some areas that will require some, some very focused attention to ensure that you know what you need in order to, um, to create solutions to help meet ICD-10 compliance without disrupting your business. So from one of the, obviously one of the biggest impacts to, uh, as a result of ICD-10 will, will be revenue management. And this is especially big for a small physician practice. Um, as practice managers, I'm sure that you are answerable for the flow of revenue as it pertains to ensuring that claims are submitted and reimbursement is coming in in a timely manner. Um, since physicians' primary source of revenue are claims payments, any disruption obviously will have some negative impacts. 
if the practice cannot submit the claims due to noncompliance, whether that means that you aren't ready or your systems aren't ready, um, or if there are issues with documentation that slow down the claims process, whether it's taking longer to code a claim um, or the documentation isn't complete enough and you have a lot of back and forth, then the revenue will slow down considerably, which means that that revenue that supports the practice will be negatively impacted. So we don't want to disrupt our wages or, or the things that keep the, the practice running, uh, paying lease space and, um, and purchasing tools, um, you know, whatever it is that we do on a daily basis in a practice may be interrupted if we are not ready for, for ICD-10. So as we close out, just a, a high-level look at some of those impacts to the, to the small practice, um, we want to turn our focus and look at the, bill, the billing and the coding as they, uh, and, and how they, they touch our practices. What are the roles within a small physician practice and where are the coding and billing touch points that will require the focus of the practice manager? So as I see it, um, in general, there is the front office, the back office, and there may be a business office depending on the practice size or the organization. The practice manager will provide the, pra the management of the overall daily office tasks and issues, um, and these can be dealing with systems and their vendors like in upgrades or when there is a technical issue. Practice managers will also manage the accounts receivable as well as, as the payables or at least provide the information for the physician to make those, those, uh, those account payments. Um, the practice management will also provide management of the staff, which many times means that they know exactly what happens in each and every role in the office. And many times, a practice manager will fill in for any one role when staff is out of the office or when the office is extremely busy. Only the practice manager can really see the big picture in terms of where diagnosis codes are used and by whom. And this helps in identifying who will need training as well as the systems or tools that, use, uh, that are used that might require some form of change to support ICD-10. So practice managers really are the hub of the, the small physician practice when it comes to a project like this. You, you are a, a key player. Um, some of the areas that, that might require or that will require focus, obviously, in ICD-10, um, the front office staff may require some level of training, and that could be around verifying benefits um, or for preventive care services. Those may require specific diagnosis codes that need to be documented ahead of time, or at least ask if, if those specific services um, and that information can then be turned into a diagnosis code um, once the patient is seen and, and the, the, uh, the visit is documented. Um, and the back office staff may only need to know uh, that whatever they document in the medical record, for example, if they're a medical assistant, um, is supporting the physician, and it includes the concepts like left and right or laterality, or maybe what, a, uh, what, a, what trimester a patient is currently in. By far, the most impacted role is that of the business office where the coding and billing takes place and where denials and appeals are managed. It may be that the practice manager also does the coding and billing for the practice. I know that was my experience when I worked in uh, a small physician practice. Our practice manager um, did all of the coding and billing and followed up on all the accounts receivable. So if this is the case, then special attention has to be paid to this area to ensure that you have the knowledge and the tools necessary to use ICD-10. The roles we have today and the way we operate may need to be modified to ensure that ICD-10 implementation is successful. Um, this includes looking at the major roles within the practice and defining what they are and what they're ultimately responsible for. We don't want to tell our physicians that they need to document according to ICD-10. This obviously is not going to get us very, very far, and this is not their goal. 
their goal is patient care, and as such, their focus is on documentation that is accurate and depicts the nature of the patient's conditions and the services that were provided to maintain or improve the patient's condition. The role of the coding professional, whether they're a certified coder or a biller that is self-taught or the practice manager, is to assign the appropriate codes based on the documentation provided and asking questions when additional information is needed in order to assign the most appropriate codes. So we want to make sure that that communication aspect is also open between the clinician and whoever is doing the coding. Um, the practice manager should assure that all the billing is accurate before it leaves the practice and is supported by the documentation. Um, this ensures that any audits um, will come up clean as well as give the practice manager reassurance that the claims leaving the door are clean and reimbursement should not be Im impacted. So it's a good idea to start looking at these right now um, to, to have some sort of plan in place so that you can, um, you can address any issues that might come up um, or try to mitigate any issues off the bat um, and, and make it a, a cleaner or smoother transition to ICD-10. So as the practice manager, since you have a, a 360 view, a degree view of your practice, uh, you should probably know where all the, the points of code contact occur within your practice. And not all of these areas are, impact, are always impacted and may vary based on the systems that you use in your practice. Do you have a scheduling module in your practice management system or EHR um, or an electronic medical record that includes a pre-visit diagnosis code? If that's the case, then whoever does your scheduling may need to know that that is going to change on October 1, 2014. Um, if it is a requirement to fill in that, that space, then you'll want to know how to address that in ICD-10. If it's not required, then maybe you can make some sort of adjustment to your processes. When you order labs or imaging, do you have a list of predefined diagnosis codes for specific tests that are always used? Um, does the lab provide those diagnosis codes for you? Um, remember that the labs and the imaging centers are reliant on your diagnosis codes and terms, diagnosis terms, for payment of their services. So want to make sure that th that information is accurate as it comes from the provider. When you're submitting a referral or a request for authorization for a service or a procedure or a drug, are diagnosis codes required? Um, are, these, are there going to be new requirements from your health plans when submitting these? Um, will you need to provide new information or more complete information in order to get future services authorized? And diagnostic information is always included in the medical record and is the source for the assignment of the diagnosis codes, which are submitted via the claims for reimbursement. So it's very important to pay attention to how those codes are entered into, uh, into your systems. And most likely, remittance advice details, denials, and appeals will all include diagnosis information. Um, so if you're the one responsible for following up on that, um, then you'll want to be aware that that will most likely look different and how to address those issues should they come up um, after go live. So there is really contact with the codes from a pre-visit to a post-claim adjudication, and you will want to know where your practice's touch points are. And once you know where the codes are, how, where we see them, and how we interact with them, we need to understand how we get the codes from the patient claim to, uh, pay, pay, excuse me, from the patient visit to the claim. Does the physician select the codes from a pre-populated super bill? Um, I know that was what my physician selected that from, but that was years ago, so maybe things have changed and the super bill is not as prevalent as it was or maybe you still do use it. Either way, how do your codes, how do the codes get from the patient visit to the claim itself? Do they uh, select them from an, in an, inside an electronic medical record or an electronic health record? 
um, or are they extracted directly from the medical record by a coder or biller and then entered into the billing software. The track that the code takes from the visit to claim is important because it will give us the roadmap to what we need to change prior to go live, and this will help you define your strategy and prioritize your actions to make sure that October 1, 2014 goes off without a hitch. So the super bill, which is um, obviously a, a tool that has been used quite often uh, in the past, um, and if you do use a super bill, it's imperative that you know who maintains it. Um, was it created a long time ago? Has it been updated since it was created? Oh, I'm sorry, I've lost my slides. I'm sorry for that technical difficulty. Okay, so as I was saying, um, if your super bill was created a long time ago, um, then you will want to look and see if it has been updated since. Um, does it accurately reflect the patient case that you see in your, or the patient cases that you see in your practice today. Um, who is responsible for translating the super bill into ICD-10? Uh, and really, what will that translation look like? If there is an expansion of codes, like the one here for Otitis Media, you can see that one code translates into eight different codes, um, then how usable will that super bill be? I saw a super bill that was actually translated to ICD-10 as a test, and it went from one page front and back, which is normally what you will see, um, to four pages front and back. And that may be more problematic for a physician looking to assign a diagnosis code. And remember, the goal here is to select a code based on the facts of the patient's condition. Many times a super bill is the quick and easy way to assign a code, and it may or may not be the most appropriate. So the, the goal here is to look at who maintains it, and if we are going to maintain it, who's going to translate it, and what will that translation look like? And if you do use the super bill, it may be wise to, to work with your physician to show them how it looks in ICD-10 and if, it's, if it is indeed something that you want to continue to use. If your practice uses a practice management system or an electronic health record system, um, you're not responsible for making the changes to the applications themselves, but you are responsible for understanding how and when these updates occur. Uh, since we are less than a year away from the go-live date, it is imperative uh, to ask your vendor if the ICD-10 codes can be stored in your system now, and will they be ready to use on October 1, 2014? Or will your system require an upgrade beforehand? Those are important to know so that you can plan accordingly. What are the tools that will assist the physician or the coder in code selection within your system? What is required to ensure that the ICD-10 code is selected on October 1, 2014? And will the system maintain both ICD-9 and ICD-10 sim simultaneously? Um, keep in mind that there will be an extended period of time when we will be working with both code sets as we submit claims and manage payments and denials for ICD-9 as well as ICD-10. Uh, your system should be able to do this based on data, on data service, so you want to make sure that that functionality is there. And hopefully you're already communicating with your vendor on a regular basis and are, and are aware of the updates and timelines for those updates. If not, you should con contact them immediately to make sure you are aware of what is coming and when. It is really important to be prepared. You should also know if the upgrade is covered under your maintenance agreement. Um, since ICD-10 is fed federally mandated, it may be. But if not, you want to be sure that you're aware of the costs so that you can budget for them. And lastly, and 
pretty importantly as well, uh, what kind of training will be required because if there is a change in the functionality of your system or a new functionality altogether, chances are the vendor will need to provide you with some sort of training. So you want to be prepared for that as well. Um, if you are using coding and billing software, again, you want to know, is it, uh, is it ICD-10 ready? And it's the same as with the electronic health record or the practice management system. If you're not communicating with the vendor now about their overall readiness and plans for upgrades, then you should do so immediately so you can ensure that you are ready on uh, October 1. If you have backlogs of claims, you should establish a plan that addresses the backlog of ICD-9 claims prior to go live so that you can focus solely on ICD-10 pro productivity and claims issues as they come up. It will be very difficult to be managing ICD-9 issues that are, um, that are backlogged and trying to deal with ICD-10 as the learning curve may require more, more focused attention on ICD-10. Um, have you started any training yet? Because it is recommended that code users like billers and coders uh, be trained at least six months in advance. Will your billing software support some sort of dual coding to help the billers and coders practice coding in ICD-10? Is that an option or um, is that a functionality of, of your, your uh, application? And, and if it is, You'll, you may really want to take advantage of that because it may help you to get used to ICD-10 prior to go live and make it a little less daunting once we, once we hit the switch. And lastly, if you submit paper claims, um, you, wanna, you wanna be prepared for the, the, revi the revised CMS 1500 form. Um, changes have been approved and these will include changes to the excuse me, the diagnosis code fields as well as the number of diagnosis codes that can be used. So um, you do really want to make sure that you know what those changes are and what they look like, what the form looks like, um, just to be prepared. It's no good to have surprises on, um, on day one. Um, if you are using a billing service, then it is of the utmost importance that you begin a dialogue with them on their ICD-10 plan. If you haven't done so already, um, if they are prepared for ICD-10, then they should already be engaged in their training, their coders and billers, and should be able to provide you with the rollout and status of the training. They should also be able to tell you if they are anticipating if they will experience any productivity losses and what their plans are to mitigate the issues, such as backfilling positions. Uh, they should also be able to provide you with the status of any current backlogs of claims that they have and what their plan is to resolve them. It is also wise to ask the billing service if they will require anything from you for testing pur purposes because you want to make sure that the information that you are sending them on October 1, 2014 is what they need to make sure that they can, they can submit your claims and get your, your claims paid. The billing service may also have documentation tips for offices um, that could be used as a resource to ensure that you are providing them with the most complete and accurate information possible. So it's a very good idea to, to have a conversation with your billing service now. So after establishing how we code, it is important to address how the code gets from the practice to the payer. If you have a billing service, then it is their responsibility to know what will be needed um, for submission of claims on October 1, 2014. But if you submit your own claims, then you will need to know what will be necessary based on if you use a clearinghouse, a provider portal, or paper. Um, and I will address clearinghouses and payers uh, in a bit more detail in the next slide. Um, but we don't want to forget that there are provider portals that allow the submission of claims directly to a payer. If you use a provider portal, you will need to verify that they will be ready for ICD-10, just like any other vendor, and you will also want to find out if they require anything from you for purposes of testing. Because again, you want to make sure that your claims go, go through without a hitch. If you use paper claims, Ensure that your billing system is preparing the new CMS 1500 claims appropriately and that all of the claim requirements, all of the fields are satisfied. 
Um, again, sometimes things happen and, and things don't work as they should be, so you want to make sure that you're prepared for any, any of those little surprises. So clearing houses as the middleman between your practice and payer are responsible for ensuring that what you are submitting is valid. Um, clearing houses, and this is very important, will not provide any type of crosswalking or conversion from ICD-9 to ICD-10. So if you submit an ICD-9 code for date of service after October, September 30th, 2014, your claim will be rejected. So if possible, plan to test with your clearinghouse to ensure that the claims go through the interface as they are expected to and that they reject appropriately for any submission of non-compliant diagnosis codes. So while we like to test what works, we also want to test what doesn't work. With concerns to payers, um, it is recommended that you communicate with, at the very least, your top payers to assess their readiness. You may want to test with them as well. But you may also want to avail yourself of any changes that have occurred with benefits and coverage as well as authorizations. The overall goal of ICD-10 is neutrality from both a benefit and financial perspective, but there may be some changes that have occurred that are unavoidable. And if you provide services for workmen's compensation, you will need to assess if workers' compensation in your state is making the transition to ICD-10 they are considered non-covered HIPAA entities and are therefore e exempt from making the transition. However, many of these payers uh, have decided it is in their best interest to make the switch, so you want to talk with your payer about how these claims should be coded. So while the coding and submission and payment of claims is extremely important, important we need to address and ensure that we are keeping in mind our external clinical relationships and, and how they are impacted within our own health com healthcare communities. The physician practice will connect with many different entities throughout the day, and these include labs and imaging centers, specialists, and even hospitals. And it is extremely important to work with these ent entities to ensure a smooth transition as they are inevitably reliant on the information that you provide in order to maintain their business. We are all in this together, and as the practice manager, you can establish positive relationships with external partners now, which may also help you leverage what they've already done to prepare, prepare for ICD-10, and you can then in turn take those lessons um, and turn them into your own practice if, if they apply. When you've established a, re, uh, a relationship, then coordination and collaboration will be the key to your success as well as theirs. And the main areas of concern nationally are lab and imaging orders. So if you can update lab and imaging requests with the most accurate diagnosis code, then that will help them get reimbursed for their services and avoid excessive denials and issues. And remember that the codes have to support the lab and imaging orders just like they need to support an office visit. Also, if you have standing orders that span the compliance date, make an effort to work out a plan with your lab and imaging partners to address this issue. It may be something as simple as providing the appropriate ICD-10 code ahead of time, which in turn provides you with the opportunity to use the codes prior to go live. But you do want to work with your your partners, your lab partners and imaging partners to assess what they may need. And without a doubt, support other physicians, specialists, and providers with accurate documentation because they will use your office documentation to order tests and medications and provide treatment, and it is imperative that it is as complete and accurate as possible. So in order to make ICD-10 successful, a much of our focus is, and attention is on training and clinical documentation, which are really the cornerstones to understanding how to use ICD-10 and, and, of course, how to um, relay uh, what happened in the visit through the codes themselves. So as practice manager, you may be responsible for identifying your office's training needs and establishing a plan and timeline to complete the training. And areas that should be looked at are um, documentation improvement for physicians. And remember, this is not documentation that mirrors ICD-10 codes. That's not, what we, that's not what we want. 
um, but we want documentation that helps the selection of accurate codes by the coding professional. So however that looks, if there are gaps, um, it's good to identify any of those gaps now and be able to address them go, uh, go live. Front and back office will likely require um, a general overview of ICD-10 along with training that is specific to their duties, whether they are referrals and authorizations or medical record documentation support. It really is role specific. And the business office, specifically uh, the coder and biller training, should be specific to the practice, such as if you're a cardiology office or a urology office or a general family practice. You really should take the time to focus on those specialty areas and not worry about the whole of ICD-10. That way you're ready to go on go live with what you need to know to ensure that the claims go out the door um, okay. And training in all circumstances should be targeted to what the physician practice sees on a daily basis. And this will help you to reduce any unnecessary training and that, that could ultimately be a distraction and prove to be more frustrating than valuable or even costly. So you can determine how to get the training into your office, um, and this is an important, important task as well in your overall implementation. For example, will you need external re uh, training resources? Uh, will they provide computer-based learning or is it face-to-face? -face? Is there a budget for ICD-10 and does it include training? Make sure in your budgeting um, you should consider loss of staff productivity during training. Um, that, that should be part of it, as well as reimbursement of training costs to staff, as well as any vendor products. Uh, there is a plethora of uh, free ICD-10 training that is offered by CMS, which may help you to provide the training that the majority of your staff needs. And then you can focus your training budget on the staff that, re that will require more in-depth training. Maybe you can leverage the expertise of a coder or biller that is in your office, or maybe it's you yourself that can take in-depth training and then provide the rest of the office with what they need to know for Go Live, uh, which is a train-the-trainer approach. And as part of the overall training plan, you'll want to make sure that your staff is ready and proficient in ICD-10 post-training and pre-go live. This may look like purchasing assessment modules from a, a training vendor or coding organizations such as the American Academy of Professional Coders or the American Health Information Management Association. In the end, what ICD-10 is really about is good patient, or what we are about as healthcare is good patient care. Um, this includes both the documentation and coding uh, that it supports. Uh, training helps to understand the changes and document completely based on all of the facts and the key medical concepts that are relevant to patient care. We know that patient care is ultimately the focus, so again, we're just trying to support good patient care with good documentation and in turn good coding. So coding can then include the key concepts that are supported by coding standards and official guidelines for reporting, and then those, those claims are processed appropriately and your reimbursements come back clean. So now we have an action plan. We're ready, we, we know what our impacts are, um, we, we've identified where ICD-10 touches our specific practice, we know what our training needs are. As the practice manager, you'll need to know where you are now in order to plan your strategy to ensure compliance. Again, education and training are key, as we just discussed, so be sure this is an integral part of your action plan and that it starts sooner rather than later. Again, April 2014 is six months prior to go live, so if you haven't started any type of training now, um, please look at all of the resources available um, and do, do start some level of training as soon as possible. Um, start working with your vendors now so that you maintain business continuity. Um, you have a little bit of time that if there are issues that pop up or challenges, you can address them. 
And also know that you will be, um, you will be supporting implementation as well as post-implementation. The work doesn't end October 1, 2014. We have to actually use ICD-10 after. So there will be a level of, of, um, of work that will have to occur post-implementation. So we want to look at the implementation strategy in a little bit more detail, and there are two phases. Phase one includes the assessment, which, were, is, which is where all of your impacts um, and, and challenges are identified. And using the process of looking at where the codes are in your office and who touches them should give you a solid starting point from which to do your analysis and your planning. And you want to be sure to prioritize based on what needs to be done in order for you to submit claims on October 1, 2014. Please make sure that this plan includes what the front office, back office, and physician um, need to do and, is who, and who in those offices are responsible for what um, and the tasks and a timeline to get them done. So clear communication, clear planning is very key here. And as the practice manager, you will need to communicate with your vendors to determine timelines for upgrades, readiness, and testing. Um, you should also establish a contingency plan should a vendor not be ready. It may be that you have to drop to paper claims until their system is ready for a short period of time. However, if there is a significant issue with your vendor's readiness that will impact you negatively, then you may need to look at other options. Um, you'll want to establish a communication plan with payers about their readiness and a plan to ensure all billing is current and backlogs are minimal. That is very key for, for the next phase because you don't want to be, um, again, dealing with your backlogs in ICD-9 and trying to move forward in ICD-10. So phase two is where the rubber meets the road. In phase, this phase um, should start as soon as possible because it is where all the actual work needs to be done. Um, this is where you will convert your super bills. So if you use them or continue to use them, um, this is where you'll want to uh, do those translations and, and make sure you know what your super bills will be looking like in ICD-10. This is also where your systems and your applications will be upgraded. It is highly important to monitor your vendors here um, to make sure they meet all of their timelines. And if they do not, your, tra your transition to ICD-10 um, may have a, a, a challenge that you'll need to address. Um, if there are any issues that come up internally or with external vendors or partners, you'll want to address them immediately. Make sure that your training has begun no later than um, April 2014. Again, that's six months prior to go live. So that should give you plenty of time uh, to prepare for ICD-10 for your, for your practice. And remember that the work does not stop on October 1. You will still need to monitor coding and billing accuracy. In fact, you may be required to focus more closely as staff and vendors get used to the coding system. You will also need to keep a close eye on claim rejections and denials um, to notice any patterns or trends in the types of denials. Um, if they are internal, then you will need a plan for helping to resolve the issue. And if they are external, uh, then you will need a plan to work with your external partners to resolve the issues. Um, in the end, this will support quality coding and reporting efforts. And should, get you, um, and should you get audited, you will have already identified and addressed the issues. So um, it is really just a more proactive approach to ICD-10. What we want you to know is that you can do this. Um, this is not an insurmountable task, although it may seem like it at, at times. Um, but you will definitely need your, phys your physician's engagement. Um, the best way to do this is let them know what the practice needs in order to be successful. Um, make it as concise and relatable as possible and make sure they understand that there may be financial challenges if the changes aren't made or if they aren't made um, or if there are issues in, uh, not, in not understanding how to use ICD-10. Don't try to do this all by yourself. Uh, if you have the resources, allocate them. People, time, and tools are necessary to get this job done and to ensure everyone is trained appropriately. 
Um, this will reduce the need to go back and do things over again, and that's really what we want. You, you don't want to go backwards and have to fix what has been done and then have to start from square one. And your job as practice manager is really oversight. Make sure you are monitoring progress and issues and responding accordingly. Coordinate with your vendors and your payers and utilize industry tools like CMS implementation guides to help you organize and execute your transition. And reach out to other providers. You are definitely not alone. We are all making this transition together, and some of us are farther along than others and can help those who are coming up behind um, by giving um, you know, advice and lessons learned. So leverage that where you can. And make sure you are planning for the what if which means you're creating contingency plans for all those things outside of your control, whether it is a vendor or a payer or a clearinghouse. You want to make sure that you are aware of those issues and those challenges and you have a contingency plan in place to address them. And lastly, take this as an opportunity to set into motion ongoing improvements in documentation and coding to support ICD-10. Though there will be uh, less of an issue of audits and better information that can be used downstream for disease trend analytics. Payers use those, those, um, that information uh, to help um, define programs that they put in place. So the information that you provide, that the practice provides at the point of care is crucial downstream. So, we wanted to give you a, um, lots of selections of ICD-10 resources to help you on your journey. Um, there are a plethora of resources, and all of these resources are valuable, and they can definitely help you in your planning and implementation. Um, the CM CMS has an ICD-10 website with lots of, of information. Um, it includes the implementation uh, guides that are there, and they are, there is a guide specific to small practice, small physician practice. So if you haven't had a chance to look at that, I definitely recommend you looking uh, into that implementation guide because it could provide some valuable information. There is also um, the general equivalence mappings, uh, known as the GEMS. Those documents are available on, ICD, on the ICD-10 website as well. Uh, these, these are great resources if you want to, if you are in fact going to be translating your super bill, uh, the GEMS can definitely be used to help you in those efforts. Um, we will, uh, um, I've used them to help direct me, not as a, a place to code necessarily, but to help direct me um, into, the, into the place where I need to go to find the right ICD-10, um, and, and these are actually a very valuable document. Um, Medicare has their learning network articles, the LM, MLNs that, will, um, that are, definitely include lots of, of um, ICD-10 information. Um, you, can, you can look at those online, <coughs> excuse me, as well as the ICD-10 national provider calls that they hold. Um, if you haven't participated in any of those, um, um, those are also a very valuable resource. You can also um, look at the national coverage determinations to get an idea of um, what ICD-10 looks like um, in those areas, as well as the Medicare Learning Network itself. So again, um, CMS, Medicare has lots of um, information that will be valuable to to you in your journey. Um, there are also the Medicare reimbursement mappings. Um, these are, have been posted um, and they are in draft. They will be finalized uh, through the rulemaking, formal rulemaking. Um, also available in these are the, um, the ICD-10 MSDRG conversions from ICD-9 to ICD-10, um, which may be uh, of value to you as well. Um, just to give an idea of what that shift looks like from a, from a reimbursement standpoint. Um, Medicare claims processing guidance for ICD-10 is also available. So if, you, if you'd like to look at what uh, the, the billing or the claims processing guide, guidance is for 
uh, the Medicare fiscal intermediaries um, or the Medicare contractors, then you can access those here as well. And for training resources, um, if you are looking for some expertise or some, some training um, recommendations, training products, um, you can always visit the American Health Information Management Association, or AHIMA, as well as the American Academy of Professional Coders. Um, they have a, um, quite a bit of on information available uh, in regards to training, as well as training products. Um, so again, those are options to you as well. And if you would like to visit uh, the PACOM and uh, website, our YouTube site, you can uh, look at the, the previous trainings for small practice on the YouTube site. Um, and again, those are of great value, and anybody can log in and, and watch those from beginning to end and includes the full, uh, the full um, uh, uh, dialogue, everything. Um, again, another great resource for you as well. So thank you. Um, that completes the presentation, and I'm, I would like to open it up for questions. Everybody put your questions um, in the left margin chat, and then uh, the presenter will, will go ahead and address them in that fashion. Okay. Um, can you tell us more about mapping? Um, I can tell you a lot about mapping. <laughs> I've done mapping. Um, uh, it really depends on what it is that you um, you need to know concerning mapping. Um, the ICD, the the general equivalence mappings are the basically the national standard for mapping from ICD-9 to ICD-10. Um, what's good to know about them is that they really are approximations of the um, of I, what ICD-10 as close as you can get to ICD-9. Um, that, that is the, the, the greatest description. Um, they are not, I think within, there's 3,500 codes in ICD-9 and ICD-10 that are considered exact matches. So um, really the, the majority of the ICD-10 codes are, are considered an approximate or, so there's a difference in some way, in some form. So if you use the general equivalence mappings, um, you will want to make sure that you look at them in totality as they are um, they're separated by uh, as forward mapping, which is ICD-9 to ICD-10, and backward mapping as ICD-10 to ICD-9. And since there is that separation, um, you, you don't get all of your ICD-10 codes in the forward mapping, and you don't get all of your ICD-9 codes in the backward mapping. So the, the intent is to use them together so that you can see the, the whole universe of ICD-10 and how it relates to ICD-9. Um, it's a useful practice when you're trying to get used to what ICD-10 looks like, um, but it is not a cure-all, and it certainly does not replace actually looking up and um, looking at the codes in their, in their native form as the um, as the um, uh, as the code set itself, so um, it's a good direction to, or it's a good practice for for getting used to the codes and maybe to answer some questions. Um, but it is certainly not the cure all for everything. Um, Uh, are the ICD-10 codes still being drafted, or is it appropriate to go ahead and order? Uh, technically, the ICD-10 uh, codes are still in draft, yes, because it's not uh, the official code set until October 1, 2014. I believe that most of the, uh, the, the actual code manuals themselves are in draft form and say that they're in draft form. Um, there are mild changes that are made. I, I, if, you're, if you aren't aware, there's a code freeze 
So ICD-9 is not being updated, nor is ICD-10, except for in those cases where we need to add something of uh, extreme value. Um, so you could look at the draft and say that it's fairly, fairly complete, um, but it will be updated uh, October 1, 2015, I believe. Um, so if you do order a manual, just know that it's in draft and will be draft until October 1, 2014. Um, there, is, let's see, I am standing, or I'm starting with doctors to help them uh, better their documentation. Is there anything out there for uh, physicians? They are very busy and would love to be able to give them handouts or webinars geared to the physicians. Um, I believe there are uh, there are resources for physicians, um, and I believe that uh, one of the previous um, uh, webinars, PACOM webinars from over the summer, Dr. Joe Nichols provided uh, a webinar, and I believe there's some pretty pertinent information there for doctors and documentation um, that may be of value. So there's there's definitely that option. Um, but there are quite there's quite a bit of information out there for physicians. I know that the um, I also know that the uh, American Academy of Professional Coders and um, American Health Information Management Association may also have resources that can help as well. Um, let's see. Will CPT laterality modifiers, um, I get this one a lot, be eliminated as laterality is now defined by diagnosis? No. The simple answer to that is that in, in essence, the CPT laterality will be supported by the diagnosis codes. Um, so those will not be replaced because if you're a, um, if you're a physician practice, you're still submitting CPT codes for payment purposes. Um, and those modifiers will still be required for those for those claims. Um, but your ICD-10 codes will want to match those. Um, payers may begin to implement edits, or there may be edits in place already that check against a um, a diagnosis code and a laterality modifier. Um, let's see. Any other questions? Uh, where can you find resources or examples that show the in-depth documentation that will be required on the physician's notes? Um, I believe, again, the PACOM uh, YouTube channel has a, um, a webinar that focuses on some of that information. So you can certainly visit that. Um, and again, if you go to any of the coding um, sites that they should have some information, as well as uh, CMS um, will have some, I believe, some some information on the on that as well. So there is really a plethora of information uh, available for documentation and whatnot. Uh, the dates that the new uh, 1500s will be used, I actually do not know the answer to that question. Um, does uh, Paul or Kathy, does anybody know if there's a date when the 1500s will be used? Hi, this is Denicia. How are you? Um, I believe it's oh. October 1. It, it, it includes, it's been updated to include ICD-10. So those are the okay. new forms, if they're referring to the new forms. Okay. So Thank the you. new forms will be um, ready for use October 1, 2014? Yes. Okay, great. For use. Thank you. For use, okay. Um, and as far as when will you be ordered to be able to order the new forms, I would check with um, whoever, whoever supplies your new forms now may know that information or have that information. So um, if you're able to contact your vendor of forms to get a, an idea as to when those forms will be available, um, I would uh, advise contacting them as soon as possible to make that part of your plan as well. 
Um, and as far, I have a question here. I work in a mental health private practice. How is DSM five affected by ICD ten? Um, my understanding is that um, it's the the impacts are minimal as they took into account when they were making the updates to DSM four. Um, they were taking into account the impacts of ICD ten. So. Um, you would, while you would still use your DSM-5 for um, for what you use it today, but you would you would continue to use ICD-9 uh, up until September 30th, 2014, and then you would use ICD-10 to um, bill your mental health claims. Um, and then a last question here. Any idea how specific diagnosis needs to be for anesthesia? Um, that would be relative to the documentation. It, it is apply, it's making sure that the documentation meets the need for um, your diagnosis service or your anesthesia services. So um, that would still obviously be as specific as the documentation. So you want to look at that from from an anesthesia perspective, what kind of terms do you need to document? What do you normally document? And how does that look like? What does that look like in ICD-10? And I think that, I believe that concludes our, we are now at one o'clock. I thank you um, everybody for joining me and um, keep, keep plugging yeah. along in ICD-10. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank you so much, Mandy, for that presentation. This topic is, is critical for managers of small practice, and it does fall on them, and, and they are on the hook for sorting this out. And so we really, really appreciate all the support that we're receiving um, from CMS, and we want to thank you very much. And I want to reach out to those of you who made time to, to, to uh, participate today and let you know that if you have questions that are not being answered, um, if you think, well, gee, you know, it would be really great if we could get a webinar on this particular perspective or something like that, please do send us that information. This program and this webinar training series is designed to serve you, the PACOM membership. Um, so please do, don't, don't be shy, speak out and let us know. Um, you can send your emails to uh, Karen, um, Gosh, what, what did I, what, let, me, let me flip a slide here. Uh, um, we before had an email address on there. You know what, just send it to karen at paycom.com and I'll make sure it gets where it needs to be um, so that we can make sure that we're getting the information out there that you want. But CMS and the whole team here is very, very focused on making sure that we're answering you and your questions and making sure that you have the resources that you need to be successful in this transition and we appreciate you working with us to do that. Um, the recording of this will be available beginning tomorrow uh, on uh, youtube.com slash PACOM. CEU certificates can be um, received through request at ceu at paycom.com. And if you're a PACOM member and you just want to log the CEU in your account, just go to My Membership and log the CEU in your account. That's all you need to do. Um, thank you all very, very much, and have a wonderful rest of your day. All, at all attendees are muted.